Good afternoon. I am Tamika Tilleman. I'm the director of the Bretton Woods II program here at New America. We are delighted to welcome all of you to what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating discussion uh, with George Levinson Cohen and Mike Crowley on George's new book, Capital and the Common Good. Uh, before we get to that, and, and that is, of course, the main event, I'd like to tell you all a little story. And this is a story that begins in 1956, many years ago, uh, in a little agricultural part of uh, California. And there was a brilliant scientist, a Nobel Prize winner, named William Shockley, who had, at that point, uh, decided he was going to set up a lab to develop something entirely new. And so he got together with eight of the best scientists he could find and launched this new effort called Shockley Labs, which was, after a year, it became clear to those eight scientists not going to be able to take the technology that they were working on, which was the semiconductor, and move it forward as quickly and as effectively as the eight scientists there had hoped. And so these eight did something extraordinary. They went off on their own, and they started a new firm called Fairchild Semiconductor. And in the process, they created the model for modern venture capital. This is something that did not exist previously, uh, but they developed the template for what it means to have venture capital. They developed the template for what it meant to be a tech startup. And it was really the financial innovation of creating venture capital and creating the tech startup that led to many of the benefits and many of the innovations that we enjoy today and that we work on here at New America uh, in, in the realm of digital technology. If you look back at their new company, Fairchild Semiconductor, and trace its DNA, today you will find over $2 trillion in market capitalization that goes back to this group of eight scientists. They became known in Silicon Valley as the traitorous eight. And I believe that today, once again, we are at the threshold of a really important stage in financial innovation. And we are at the threshold of using capital in ways that it hasn't been used before to solve problems that right now are going unsolved. We are living in a world where there is a massive quantum of capital and there is a massive quantum of problems. But frankly, we don't have good business models that are connecting those two as efficiently and effectively as we need to. And we're seeing some very expensive market failures occur as a result of that. What Georgia is doing with her book is providing us with a roadmap, kind of the, the first chapter of this new revolution uh, in finance, this new revolution in financial innovation. And I think it's very important because it goes to the core of not only some of the challenges that are affecting our financial system, but really many of the challenges that are affecting our societies and our country. Uh, if you think about a lot of the discontent that we saw in this last election, people feel that the system isn't working correctly. They feel that it's not doing what it needs to in order to solve their problems. We have in many ways financial architecture that is very good at creating wealth, but it's struggling to create value. And Georgia is uh, really a, a peerless interpreter of these new solutions that are opening up right now. When I first came to these issues, she was one of my guides. Her book, uh, her first book, was uh, one of the first things that I read uh, as I was digging in on the work of Bretton Woods II uh, and the work that we do with large asset owners to uh, encourage them to channel resources in ways that can help reduce global risks and global volatility. And with this latest installment uh, in her growing library, uh, I, I think all of us are in for a real treat. Uh, she's, she's taking us uh, on a very important discussion uh, that I think is really central to many of the key challenges that we're confronting right now. Uh, so with that, let me hand things over to Georgia and uh, you know, Mike, who, who needs no introduction for his incredible work at Politico. Uh, and we're looking forward to a great discussion today. So thank you. Thank you, Jamaica, um, and uh, and thank all of you for coming. I, it's hard. Um, it's hard to compete with the distractions and the circus of the press conference. I thought it was just going to be hard to compete with the session starting later this afternoon, but um, it's never dull. Uh, but I so so thank you all for making the time. Um, and and I would just add, and I sort of tried to do this 
uh, in the months discussing this book since the election, I actually think that they are related for precisely the reasons that Tamika outlined, which is that um, you know we ignore um, things like economic inequality and prosperity that isn't sort of broad based at, at our peril. And I think we've finally seen a little bit of, of comeuppance for sort of ignoring some of those issues. And so what I try to do, and we'll discuss it in this book, is think about ways that finance and investment and a broader set of capital and resources can be brought to bear on some of those problems. So Tamika, thank you. And um, I want to give a nod to the work that you've been doing here in New America, Bretton Woods, um, and some of the other work that you're doing at the intersection of finance and technology. Uh, it's been a treat to first through profits and purpose and now in sort of other capacities to work with you. And I'm just also delighted to still have a relationship with New America and be a fellow here. And I'm very grateful to Anne-Marie Slaughter for sort of taking some bets on us. And I think um, our vision for you know, new and different ways that states and markets, I think, can and should align. And other colleagues from New America, I don't know if Mark Schmidt is here or, um, or Reed. And I know Fuzz, I've had sort of a lot of fun. Also, Tyler Bug in New York, so that's a treat. Uh, and Jonathan Soros also was very, um, was great in getting all of this off the ground. Uh, and I would also be remiss, I think, this, this project, uh, Capital and the Common Good, which, was, which I completed while I was at New America, even though based in New York, um, was funded in large measure by colleagues at the Rockefeller Foundation, who supplied, supplied financial support, but also a lot of thought leadership um, on this work and continue to do so. And so even though I'm now uh, at the Pershing Square Foundation, um, I continue to work with them, and I know um, Tamika and New America does as well. Finally, um, a big thank you to, to my colleagues. So um, uh, as, as Tim Ang said, Mike needs no introduction, but I'm particularly grateful on a day and a week like today um, and this week and these months. Uh, it's, I think as we, sometimes we start to enter our few couple of decades oh. of, of a professional life and a career, and it's just always an incredible privilege to be able to say someone that I've known like Michael, for decades, is not only um, an expert and a, and a guide on making sense of the world, and I know that you've reported um, really from every country across the globe, um, but I think in the last few months and weeks and even this week, um, really making heads or tails that the, sort of the importance <laughs> of your, the fourth estate, but also your work um, in Russia and, and sort of foreign affairs and helping um, really be a voice and a brave voice um, in, this, in this environment is, is really grateful. So I know I know I have limited time with you, and, and you're going to have to run back to the office. But um, but uh, but thank you for agreeing to do this. Thank you for having me uh, to moderate the conversation. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, we're going to talk for a little bit and then take your questions. Uh, as an audience member, I always think that's the best part, so I try to remember that when I moderate. So there'll be plenty of time for you all to chime in. Uh, and for my part, this is a welcome brief distraction from antics in uh, Russian hotel rooms that uh, are not safe for, uh, for, uh, for discussion in public at the moment. I guess actually they're all over the internet. But anyway, you take the point. Georgia, uh, on your book, uh, which is so interesting, and congratulations. Uh, why don't we just start with the basics? Uh, why, did you, why did you want to write this book? What need did you uh, feel it was filling, and in particular, you know, I have to say, my first reaction, um, and it may be a common one, uh, uh, no disrespect to Wall Street and the many uh, wonderfully civic-minded, altruistic titans of finance in the world today, is that uh, we don't see capital and good uh, in the same sentence, uttered in the same breath very often, particularly since the events of 2008-ish. Um, so you're going against that grain. Uh, so why did you want to do the book and just give us some of the basics of what you're trying to accomplish with it? Um, gladly. Uh, uh, and I agree that you're right and um, the, the title was meant to, a little bit to be a nod to Piketty but also to stir some of these conversations. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit about what I think are the differences between sort of financial innovation um, and, and sort of innovation for innovation's sake and what I call innovative finance which is really meant to be can we use the tools of finance to advance um, or to tackle social and environmental and economic challenges. Uh, the gen this book really um, began life, uh, I had just finished a previous book on social entrepreneurship that really was chronicling the work of very dynamic and colorful change makers in the nonprofit sector and actually even in government and thinking about sort of what entrepreneurial solutions looked like and I was um, so more along the lines that you typically think of as people sort of um, do-gooders in the, in the usual way we define them and it was actually about the fall of 2012, had just finished that book and was in New York and Hurricane Sandy 
um, inundated the city and much of, um, much of the Northeast Corridor. Uh, and uh, I took a pause because the city shut down, but really only for a few days, and there were sort of 14-foot storm surges um, that flooded the subway, and, and, the, and when the subway, the 100-year-old plus subway system in New York shuts down, the city essentially sh shuts down. Um, and what I came to understand not that long after was that the city emerged um, with about $5 billion of damage to the subway system, and the MTA found itself uninsurable. And I remember thinking, uh, not fully realizing the import of this, except when I talked to folks at the MTA, they did pull what was really sort of a municipal finance first and went to the catastrophe bond markets, which was, I mean, we can talk about what cap bonds are. They're a little bit arcane and typically private capital markets financing instrument. But they went to the cap bond markets to make sure that they could be, uh, to, to reinsure themselves and to open up the subway system again for transport. And it struck me in a way that I hadn't realized that this was the same kind of sort of innovation and entrepreneurial creativity that was taking place in government using tools of finance to solve problems that most of us sort of don't think about. And the woman, you know, who's like the head of risk management at the MTA, we don't typically think of her as, you know, like sort of the Wendy Cops and Future America of the world. But in fact, she was, she was being creative um, in her own right. And I started to look at other, um, I started to take an interest in sort of are there other approaches along these lines that either we don't really think about in this way or, um, uh, or that we could replicate from the New York model. So I started to look at vaccine bonds and I started to look uh, at green bonds, which actually aren't all that green, and social impact bonds, which are not even bonds, and, um, uh, and just became quite captivated with really a set of tools and instruments. Uh, this, again, and I will, um, Cut to, the, cut to the chase a little bit, this led to some discussions with colleagues at the Rockefeller Foundation and they sort of said, wow, you know, what else is out there? And um, one, and two, can we really start to think about some of these new instruments and approaches and tools as ways to bring in more capital to bear on the problem, a lot of the prob development challenges, both globally and in places like New York. Um, can we, if we don't have enough money, um, and this, this was occurring, this conversation was occurring as we were sort of moving last year from the Millennial Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals, which are these, you know, 17 incredibly ambitious and expensive goals, of which there's, you know, depending on the, how you count it, like a two and a half trillion dollar financing gap. So it really became a, a discussion about whether you know you can actually access large sources of capital um, from institutional investors and others to bear on some of these problems, given the limits of, um, of government um, and philanthropic funds. And I, I, I will get to some examples, but I would just say that over the course of writing the book, um, what I realized was actually it, what I how I define innovative finance um, is much more about what I would call smart capital, um, or not. Not just more capital. More capital is important, but it's about um, finance and the tools of finance actually giving us the security, the motivation to to make better decisions. And that's at the household level, it's individuals, that's governments. So, does insurance allow us to make long-term investment decisions, or does it allow us to save, or can we actually make investments in profession? So, it really became much more about things like trust and time, and not so much more about sort of more dollars. So give us some practical examples of what this looks like. Uh, uh, and uh, vaccine bonds is a very interesting concept, so maybe that would be one. And also, um, take a minute when you do that to tell us what's new about this. Um, is it just a more creative way of thinking? Uh, are there financial instruments that allow it that didn't exist before? But start with some tangibles that people can visualize. Uh, sure. Um, and I think, it, you know, innovation, I mean, there, is, there are a lot of words that we throw around, and I think innovation um, often is sort of seen as synonymous with new and shiny and new. And, and back to your earlier point, actually, about the sort of post-financial crisis um, anxieties about uh, financial innovation, I think, you know, Paul Volcker, among others, sort of said, you know, the only useful, the only valuable um, financial innovation is the ATM. Like, everything else, you know, all the credit defaults, all, like, all that stuff, let's leave it. And, and I, I think his point is well taken. I guess I flip it on, on his head a little bit and say, okay, there are breakthroughs, scientific breakthroughs, technological breakthroughs in finance and elsewhere, whether it's like high-speed trading or like very complex derivatives, um, or even, you know, we'll talk maybe a little bit more about some sort of blockchain and, and Bitcoin stuff, which are innovations sort of that, that um, maybe improve the efficiency of markets but aren't intended to do good in the world. And the set, the, the category of instruments that I look at are by sort of, by definition, I mean, I'm defining them tautologically, but I'm focusing on ones that I think are designed to do good. So, th so it's sort of, and, and the newness is either because they're intentionally designed to do good or 
because, um, because you're taking something that worked in one context, maybe you know, in one market, and applying it to things like public health or climate change. So a little bit more specific. Most of the, it, be, it did be, um, begin life as a project in the book focused on development finance, although increasingly, and now my work is much more focused on these applications in the US, sort of get very tangible and very specific. Um, I'm not sure how most people got here today. I know my day began uh, much earlier. Um, it has involved two mass transport systems, or three if you include Amtrak. Um, uh, but I imagine most people, or many people, were on the metro this morning. Um, and my day also included a stop on the New York City subway system. And what I hadn't fully appreciated, because every time I hot the two, day, two times a day at least, usually more, I, I, I'm on the New York City subway system, is I have a 30-day metro card. So I'm actually, you know, I pay up front each month, and I don't fully think about how much it's costing me on the ride. But it turns out that, you know, each subway ride in New York costs 275 a pop. And so if you are a daily commuter and you're doing that two times a day, that adds up. And if you're doing 500 the trips every year, it adds up. Now, fortunately, there's a 30-day pass. For New York, there's also a seven-day pass, I imagine, in D.C. I don't have one, but there's like a smart, right? You know, there's something here as well. Um, in New York, that monthly pass costs 116 bucks up front. So it's a substantial discount, but you have to have $116 up front. And it turns out that um, that is a cost-prohibitive barrier for many New Yorkers. So there are 200, there are close to 300,000 students in the CUNY system, for example, who are all commuting into school every day. And it turns out that they don't have the 116 bucks up front, so often the cost of riding the subway is cost-prohibitive. Um, and the same thing is true now that, you know, poverty is no longer really an inner-city thing, and you have people commuting in on the subway. It turns out that's cost-prohibitive. So this small group called Alice Financial, and I still can't figure out whether Avi Karnani, who runs it, has said it's not a acronym, but I'm not sure where they got Alice, but they essentially said, you know what, we're going to allow people to do layaway, which to your point is not new, right? We've been doing layaway for a long time, but they're, they basically said we're going to allow people um, uh, to buy a MetroCard on their phone from us, and we're going to have a small float, and, we're gonna, and they're essentially subsidizing so people can pay in weekly installments. Uh, this turns out New Yorkers are overpaying $500,000 a day in aggregate because they can't afford the, sub the, the subsidy. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, again, this is not um, the brilliance and the innovation of what Alice Financial is doing in New York. And by the way, the same is true in London, like all major cities. But no, it's, it's a workaround. I mean, arguably the MTA should be doing that. We should be thinking much differently about how people pay. But in the interim, there are interesting innovators who are doing things like that with, uh, with the subway in New York. And I will, I'll, would be quite a minute, but I'd like, I'll explain how I got to the I, I got to the New York example and the Alice Financial example because I had been looking at um, uh, mobile payment systems in uh, in develop in the developing world context, which is where we're sort of much more familiar. So I had been looking at the sort of M-Pesa story in Kenya. You know, where ten years ago, seventy percent of the population in Kenya was unbanked. Safaricom comes in, everyone has cell phones. Now, you know, flash forward ten years, eighty percent of the population actually has mobile money. Um, uh, and, to, and everyone knows that story. What, what became even more interesting to me when I started looking at the sort of payment story was not just, oh, people are paying for schools or people are paying, um, send, sending money um, to relatives all over Kenya, all over the world, that people are paying for utilities. What actually caught my interest, because I sort of knew that story, was not what people were paying for, it was how they were paying for it. Um, so what I hadn't, uh, what I discovered was that um, even though now in Kenya and elsewhere you have 80% of the population now using mobile, having a mobile wallet of some kind and a mobile payment, they're still off the electrical grid. So we, we sort of solved one infrastructure gap, but we still have people who, you know, it's like two billion people across the world are not on the formal electricity grid. Um, so what this means is you have, you have Kenyans who have phones, but they don't actually, they're using like single-use batteries, or they're using candles, or they're using lanterns, or they're using kerosene um, for all of their energy needs, which is you know, incredibly noxious, and it poisons, and it um, is a major source of global warming. Uh, and it's really expensive, except that people can buy it in small batches. So this is why, this is why they're doing it. And if, um, if, if you are a Kenyan family who is spending you know, more than $200 a year on kerosene, which most are, it clearly makes sense for you to install a solar panel 
that only costs 199 bucks, but it's the Alice Financial $116 situation all over again, so people just don't have the $199 up front. So out of the m story has grown a series of essentially layaway companies that are allowing people via electronic devices, via their phones, to do to install solar on a layaway. And um, MCOPA, so it's like, you know, everything, it's like my, my Swahili has improved tremendously since writing this book. But the, but a um, company called M MCOPA sort of does the same thing that Alice Financial does. So it now allows you to install solar and to pay and lay away. And, once, and, and then once you, to me that sort of exploded my mind, because once you go down that, and that has, by the way, accelerated people's adoption of solar in places like Kenya by like fourfold. But then you start to think, okay, this could be, this is being used for other utilities like water, but this could be used for, to download textbook. I mean, this, this like opens up all sorts of really interesting, um, really interesting opportunities. So um, again, this is, this gets a little bit back to the tech, you know, how much of this is about technology. That, that, that's yeah. my question. So what, uh, what's key to both those examples that you just cited is that there is, people are using their phones to be connected to a service that allows them to do this. So how fundamental is technology to what you're writing about? I mean, is this a story about technology and finance? Is technology a necessary component, or does it just happen to be a big part of some of the key examples? Yeah. Um, so I think there is a clear technology story, and I think that, you know, not unlike the VC example that Tamika talked about at the outset, you know, once it, once, once it becomes once it becomes clear that there's a market, and you then the, then you have even more investment to bring down to improve the technology. You know, I think you have those virtuous circles, and we see that with insurance and satellite technologies that suddenly allow um, proxy sort of index insurance, et cetera. But I actually think there are very significant limits to the technology. Uh, so um, one of the, one of the areas that I write about and I started to explore, and actually my work now in as a um, at a foundation is sort of making grants and actually investments in this area has to do with evolutions in microfinance. Um, and I spent a lot of time with an organization in India called IFMR Trust. Uh, and the reason I got to IFMR Trust was because people said, you know what, the big concern in microfinance is that it's always been about credit and it's always been about small loans and in fact, that's really, that's maybe necessary to get people out of poverty, but it's not sufficient. And there need to be other products. We need to have pensions, we need to have savings products, we need to do all these other things. And IFMR was on the map because they have all these other products. So they've, they've really started to think about what are the real financial needs of hospitals. So I spent a lot of time with IFMR Trust and I sort of said to them, you know, this is terrific, you have all these products. And they said, yeah, but we have to tell you a story. So they said, we had a client, this was not very many years ago, and she, um, we didn't know too much of, you know, a young woman, she was an agricultural laborer, they mostly work in rural India, and they said she, um, she came to us periodically, or, you know, um, to take loans out against her gold jewelry, of, which was like a very, very common practice all over the world, especially in rural India, and so she did these jewelry, these gold loans, and they weren't paying too much attention, and then one day she's walking to work um, in the fields, and also, unfortunately, very common, um, she's hit by, she's struck by an oncom, a, passing truck and killed. And they discover that she has five dependents. So she has, she's supporting her parents, she has two children, her husband had left her, she's also supporting a sibling. And what she really needed was not a gold loan, what she needed was life insurance. And they had life insurance in sort of their arsenal of, in their suite of products. So they could have offered this to her had they actually had a better understanding of what her, her needs were. So they've completely, in the years since, they've completely rethought their business model. There's a technology component, so they now have what they call wealth managers, and these people are compensated in very sort of enlightened ways, so they're not just pushing loans, but what they also do is they go household to household with a tablet, and they ask, they get a really deep understanding of what people, the household's financial needs are, and then they don't have to make the decisions about what products or services are sold. There's an algorithm that spits it out, but it's that very human fate. They said that there was no way we could be selling these products. Um, or services to these families if it weren't for the wealth manager who lives in, you know, who lives in the villages, who's a local, recognized, trusted person, and they said that it's, the technology alone does not get us um, to adoption of these products and services, that we need to have this, the, the trusted advisor, and I sort of, you know, I said that it's like this fit, this finance, um, finance innovation and, and technology and trust that allows this to happen, and just, just briefly one more point on this, I was relaying, I sort of, spent time with this, this company in India, and I came back to the US and was relaying this story to colleagues of mine at Columbia Business School, and they said, well, you must know, 
Justine Zinkin at Neighborhood Trust uptown in Upper Manhattan in the Bronx because it's the same story that you just heard in rural India. And I, I, you know, I said, oh yeah, of course, and, and of course I did not know who Justine was. So I immediately went uptown and paid a visit to Justine. And Neighborhood Trust was a, a sort of, you know, typical 20th century, actually started life as a credit union. Uh, and Justine took it over. And again, they had done really interesting things with technology. So they had developed an app called Paygoal, which was allowing poor families in Upper Manhattan to think about saving. They had developed a socially responsible uh, credit card that were, was helping people pay down their debt. Um, and when they started surveying the households and sort of saying, like, well, which of these apps, like, which of, which of these products is, do you like the most? Like, wh how are you most likely to use them? Everyone came back and they sort of said, you know, it's Marisol. And so I, so I looked at Justine and I'm thinking like Alice financially, so I think it's like, or it's, you know, it's an acronym because I had a business school, so I'm like Marisol's like metrics and accountability. And they're like, no, no, it's Marisol. Like Marisol's a lady who lives in Washington Heights who essentially works for the trust and is getting people to sign on to the products and services. So I think um, there are a number of these interesting um, sort of innovative financial organizations that are understanding that you can develop the apps and you can develop the products and you can use the cloud and you can do all these things, but to get poor people to, you know, use savings products and don't, and not worry that they're going to be deported, you know, or actually to trust a financial system that they actually haven't engaged with before you have to layer. There's this sort of human interaction and baseline trust that's also yeah. part of it. Yeah. Reminds me a little bit of journalism where uh, the, there's all kinds of, you can start up a media company and aggregate from all over the place, but real original reporting requires talking to people and seeing them face to face. So technology is always kind of brought back down to those human interaction realities, isn't it? Um, Vaccine bonds, you, you mentioned them at the top and mm -hmm. you, you start the book with them and it's just an interesting concept and I just thought that might be another opportunity for you to kind of unpack uh, what, what it is that you're talking about. Sure, um, and I think, and I will just, um, I, so I think the vaccine bonds case is interesting for a number of reasons. What I'd say is I think it's part and parcel of a larger discussion about prevention. So the vaccine bond case, just very briefly, um, uh, is something called, um, you know, it's part of something called the International Financing Facility for Immunization um, that was created in the UK, a sort of partnership actually there between Goldman Sachs and the Chancellor of the Exchequer several years ago. Um, and the idea was relatively simple. I mean, the idea was, and this was um, as we were sort of approaching, so 10 years ago, it was sort of the lead up to the Millennium Development Goals rather than Sustainable Development Goals. But again, the idea was similar that, you know, we have these very ambitious goals in health and we don't necessarily have the, enough resources to pay for them. And Gordon Brown sort of said, you know, is there something, he went to his chums at Goldman and said, is there something that we can do about it? And there was- Can, a, I, can I just interrupt? Because you, yeah. you point out, you make an interesting point, which is it's not just a shortage of resources, but it's, it's, a, it's a market uh, failure, or at least it's a, it's a gap that the market won't fill, right? So this is an effort to, sort of step in where the market won't work, not just purely an absence of, say, government public funds, right? No, that's right. Where there's a market opportunity, but it's not being filled efficiently or it needs a little bit of a nudge, so to speak. That's right, and the market failure here, well, there are a number of them, but one of them has to do with the fact that investments in prevention are substantially more cost effective than waiting for a problem to metastasize. And so, right, so we know that vaccines are infinitely, I mean, the Gavi Alliance says that the vaccines that they're investing in have an ROI of 18%. So we know investing in vaccines is much more cost effective than waiting, um, you know, for sort of treating full-blown disease. And by the way, and we can talk about some other, you know, treating, treating a full-blown disease like an Ebola or, you know, a Zika, uh, containing that is itself infinitely more cost-effective than waiting for something to essentially become a, a pandemic. Um, and the same is true on climate, right? Climate change now is, is much more cost-effective than catastrophic effects of climate change. And we can say the same things about early childhood education, job training, and incarceration. Right? We, we know that, you know, by orders of magnitude, maybe 40 times more we're spending on responding to these disasters, sort of human and man-made. Um, so the market failure has a lot to do with um, resources that are not avail available now. The IFM example, and there are a number of others in the book, and we can, we can talk more about them. What, what, what the IFM folks said is they said, okay, we know that there are a number of countries that have essentially committed to development assistance for next year, for five years from now, from 10 years from now, for 20 years from now. Um, but we don't necessarily want that money 20 years from now. We want that money today. So is there a way, and this is to your question about innovation, right? The Finance 101 is a front-loading issue. Finance 101 says we borrow from our future selves 
for money that we need today, and we repay it over time. So what the IFM folks got, said, IFM folks said, okay, let's take those development pledges that are being made 20 years out and front load them and issue a bond against them, and by the way, we can securitize them, which is, you know, it really is a complicated word, but that just means we can bundle, you know, UK, France, US, a number of countries, future development assistance, front load them, issue a bond against them, and they've raised about $5 million for, and they could have used the money for anything. I mean, that's the thing, it's not necessarily decide, de, tied to vaccines, but the decision was made to give the money to the Gavi Alliance, which does vaccines, because the ROI is so high. But there have been a number of, we know Tamika was part of these discussions last summer in the lead up to the sustainable development goals, but there, people are looking at that financing facility um, as a model to say, can we do the same thing for maternal and child health? Can we do the same, can we essentially take our future pledges and get that money and use it today? Um, and I think that that's, in some ways, you know, whether it's social impact bonds, I'm happy to open it up, there's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of hype, those are small dollar amounts, um, or actually really new interesting insurance products. So another case study in the book has something called the Africa Risk Capacity, um, which addresses um, drought in the same way. So it allows African countries to enter into an African-owned insurance pool um, as a way of responding to drought before it becomes famine in ways where prior they'd sort of, you know, drought would hit, countries would go to the UN, have an appeal, there'd be sort of the money would come too little, too late, and, and drought had morphed to famine. So I think insurance is another way, both at the household level and sort of at the sovereign um, or even multilateral level that's allowing, um, that's just allowing countries to react sooner. And, you know, and I think that African risk capacities has focus has started with drought, but it's, you know, it is ready to, it is a now a model for, a pan, for Ebola or the next pandemic. So a couple more quick ones, and yeah. then uh, we can take questions from the audience. I think we're, we're probably about halfway now. Um, I'm just curious because you mentioned Bitcoin, uh, which is such an inherently interesting subject, and I wasn't quite sure what the context was, but you said we can come back to Bitcoin. I just think Bitcoin is inherently interesting. How would Bitcoin figure into what you're talking about? Well, the, where, where I and Tamika and I have been having this conversation now a little bit, where I, what, I, what I was trying to do was sort of posit that there is a difference between um, innovation for innovation's sake and sort of financial engineering um, and, uh, and those that I would call innovative finance, which is where we've taken um, all kinds of fintech approaches um, at the intersection of finance and technology and said, okay, we are actually going to apply these for good, right? So the, so the, uh, the IFMR, um, sorry, the IFM case I was just speaking about earlier, took, um, you know, securitization and sort of typical bond issuances, but they said, you know what, and the, and the guy, who, by the way, who did it at Goldman had never worked on social or environmental or health, public health issues in his life, but he said, I know how to securitize things and I'm gonna try to apply this to a public health situation. Um, so I think that I sort of lead, you know, if we were talking about a category of innovations like speed trading or like a whole bunch of sort of very elaborate um, securitization approaches that aren't necessarily intend to solve problems. And I think the early stages of some of um, Bitcoin or some of the blockchain, blockchain technologies and other, other sort of fintech innovations, right? I mean, all of us could figure out how to pay each other back for lunch by a Venmo, like 400 apps, um, which is an interesting innovation, but it's not necessarily gonna sort of like solve poverty across town or across the world until people actually deliberately say, how do we apply some of these um, technological solutions to like real pressing market failures and and public needs and so th 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 I think Bitcoin has moved into the realm where people are saying okay there's there are these amazing blockchain technologies they weren't necessarily invented to solve pressing social problems or address market failure but there's a huge opportunity here right this isn't just like so Goldman Sachs can do online lending All right. okay so my last question looking ahead mm -hmm. a little bit um, and of course, everybody's talking about Donald Trump today, uh, uh, and yesterday and tomorrow. Um, what, I guess my question is, putting this into a kind of public policy context more, um, putting the focus on public policy context a little more explicitly. And my launching point is uh, uh, that Robert Schiller, Robert Schiller, the Nobel laureate, uh, uh, gave your book a very uh, nice plug in a column a couple of months ago uh, in which he said that uh, he kind of recommended it as reading for the Trump administration. Now, um, I think I know, and Tamika probably uh, uh, would vouch for this, that in the sort of diplomatic development community, we are not at a moment of high optimism vis-a-vis -vis the Trump administration and uh, its priorities. Um, but having said that, do you think that there's anything that 
maybe not Trump himself, it's not clear how much time he spends reading books, uh, but, but uh, the policymakers around him, uh, maybe people at the State Department, Rex Tillerson types, uh, or maybe some of this would go through commerce, I don't know. Question being, what could they learn from this book in a kind of practical policymaking way? Uh, so I, I think, you know, I, th I think on whether, on whether, you know, on the, on the business orientation and markets orientation of this president and this administration, like everything else, I think that they're still, um, at best, open questions. I, I, what, I guess what I would take away, you know, sort of several months ago, I think the questions about some of this work on innovative finance and impact investing and the sort of role of markets and development and in economic development in the U.S. were very much sort of, you know, are we going to see another White House Office of Social Innovation? You know, how is the State Department and USAID going to continue to evolve along the lines that they've evolved in thinking about these in enlightened ways? You know, what is Treasury going to do vis-a-vis -vis guidance on fiduciary responsibility, all that kind of stuff? Um, in parallel, I think, and, and, and I think that those have been, you know, incredibly important sort of federal level measures towards encouraging investment and socially responsible investment. At the same time, I think, you know, and this is not to totally shy away from the question, it's just to say I think a lot of the important policy innovation has always occurred at the state and local level, mm -hmm. and I don't think that that's necessarily um, going to change. I mean, this, this, I don't have a huge amount of optimism for the state houses, but I do think that things like social impact bonds and paper performance legislation, although the, we've had um, federal legislation to encourage that at the local level or sort of funds at Treasury that encourage it, that, that is continuing sort of at the state house and, and local level. And I do think that you still have, um, you know, the questions that, that we sort of led with, which was how does a subway system and a public transportation system respond to a hurricane or how does it think about subsidizing, um, you know, subway fares for daily users who can't afford them, that those are still sort of local problems and local solutions that aren't necessarily um, hinging on bold and, and important and federal, federal. federal leadership. But, um, you know, and I, the, the global question, you know, I mean, that's, that, that's even more challenging. I do think, you know, leading up to this, that the, some of the leadership globally on this was coming from places like the UK, or at least some of the thought leadership. I know Tamika is doing some work with the Canadians. I mean, I think that there, you know, it might be a moment to um, allow for uh, leadership at the sort of federal level to take place in other places, and then you know, people who have been working on this for a long time in the U.S. can play a role in that respect. But I don't, um, uh, I, I, I don't. I'm not counting on Donald Trump to. Yeah. to, to well, read you, the you book. do hear some rhetoric from. People around Trump to suggest that they, you know, har harnessing the private sector. I mean, there there could be a natural synergy to the extent that you're not talking about sort of quote unquote big government, quote unquote nation building. So maybe, but um, let me keep my promise, which I've already started to break. Uh, and gentlemen there in the yellow sweater, and we'll go to you next. trillion dollars of, um, of infrastructure coming down. How do we leverage that? I'm suggesting that you can get social equity, social problems. That's what I've been doing this for 40 years. So I, I, I challenge the idea that there hasn't been an effort at innovative finance in the last 10. I think there has totally been, and it's been a long history that Rockefeller funded our work 15 years ago in impact investment. We called this mission-related investment then. But an insurance capacity or guarantee or even a sovereign guarantee or a state guarantee using debt assets would help leverage a lot of private money uh, that's going to be spent on infrastructure. So j instead of just building a big pipe in the ground, how can you help build a business for a, a minority contract that's better than a job? No, I, I, I completely agree. And, and the if, uh, no, no, absolutely. In the if I'm example, the World, Plank, World Bank played the role of guarantor, but it would be, I, I completely agree that sort of, you know, I, to Mike's point, the sort of infrastructure question is the, you know, multi-billion dollar, multi-trillion dollar question of, Yes, we're going to use the private sector, but you know, is there an enlightened way to do that so that there's some, you know, and it's not just sort of outsourced privatization that um, is not really done in a, like an enlightened public-private partnership way. No, I completely agree. Right here. Hi, um, 
Hold on, wait for the mic. For being here, this is very interesting, very enlightening. Um, so I, I'm a consultant and I work mostly with donors and uh, social sector organizations on helping them kind of navigate the space. Um, and I think there's definitely like an informational barrier in terms of trying to figure out the universe of things that are kind of happening and I think your, your book does a fantastic job of kind of laying that out. Um, but of the handful of organizations that are aware of what's happening, um, I think that they're, they're, they kind of struggle to kind of understand how to really implement and operationalize some of those things and also says trade-offs between different types of instruments. Do I do an impact bond? Do I do this? Do I do that? Um, and kind of lacking on sort of those practical tools and also like assessing kind of the cost effectiveness of engagement since innovation obviously requires uh, extra costs. Um, and so I'm wondering what your views are in, in terms of kind of like what's next uh, in terms of kind of moving the field forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I assume when you say you sort of work with some donors that, that you mean largely philanthropic well, donors. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, to your question. Buy them a few copies of the book. <laughs> Boost the sales. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Exactly. Right. There you go. Um, so that's step one. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I think, I, you know, I, I, I now work for, you know, I, I work at a sort of philanthropic investment fund that does both grants and investments, and I, you know, and it's re reasonably sophisticated, and yet I still think that people don't really, you know, either, um, you know, either the real, de you know, the infrastructure type deals and all of those are sort of, you know, really for high net worth or really for institutional investors and, you know, are, no one's interested in doing anything below 30 million or you have, you know, very interesting social enterprises along the Alice Financial, but they can't absorb any, you know, they're these tiny little social enterprises, so they can't actually absorb any real kind of investment capital. I think increasingly we're starting to see some exchange, you know, that there, there needs to be, um, to your point about information, and I think we're seeing some, but some, just exchanges that make of make sort of people aware whether they are really sort of mar seeking market rate returns and are you know straight up investors or whether they sort of are philanthropists seeking some kind of blended return or just making a grant, but that knowing sort of what the range of options are, I, th I think it's still yes you know in some respects that you know the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977 sort of started the, like in some ways the field is decades old. Right, and in, so, and in some ways some of this newer, the interest from high net worths and the interest in sort of, you know, the financial service firms that all have a, an impact arm, it's very new. And I, and I think the newness suffers still from some of the, their sort of real, they're still informational and frankly definitional problems. And that may be something that, you know, in this, in this next period, a little bit more work on sort of some of the definitional issues and some of the I know some of the clarification on sort of how you actually do these investments is a good use of everyone's time. There, and uh, introduce yourself if you would, please. Okay, hi, my name is Marcy. I work with PSI, a nonprofit that's engaging in impact investing. We spent a lot of time over the last couple of years, sort of trying to understand what might be worthy of an impact investment opportunity, particularly in the public health sphere. Uh, and what we found in the conversations that we're engaging in, we're sort of hopefully near the finish line of an impact investment project um, that combines both what we call outcome payers and the investor. And it's been an interesting uh, experience for us in the sense of we talk about what might be dibbable from a development impact bond perspective. And a lot of that ties down to metrics and cost per and the risk factor associated with an investor. And I think it's a space that isn't necessarily well understood, at least by the development sector. And I'm interested in your research for the book if you, uh, if you came across or if you have any thoughts around uh, what has worked or hasn't worked or how do you set the stage for the future, hopefully what is a broader future when you think about these at scale because when they're small, the amount of work that goes into them isn't necessarily a good return on investment when you're thinking about the trade-off between traditional development dollars and more impact investing dollars. On, on the question of dibs, which are essentially development impact bonds, which are kind of the developing country version of social impact bonds, um, you know, I, I think, and I, I've been tracking these, and I'm actually now an, an investor in one, and we support philanthropically social finance, which has sort of um, uh, I put together a number of these deals. I think that, you know, the, it, it is also still quite nascent. It feels like, okay, we've been at this since 2010. If you start with Peterborough, and so maybe, you know, that's, 
seven years in, we should have a better track record, or these things should be more scalable at this point, or like, why isn't there a template, or why does it still take six months to put one of these deals together? You know, on the other hand, I think like to Mike's initial framing was very useful that like, you know, the early days of VC was sort of like these industries do take a while to take off. I, I, I still struggle, I, I, on this social, and I've had this discussion, you know, with third sector and social finance, and I think they'd actually agree. I think the social impact bonds, which are, you know, they're not bonds, they're basically you have a service provider that's loaned working capital from a private investor, which is typically a philanthropist, to say, make this intervention now. So work with prisoners so they don't go back to prison, or work with our early, work with kids, poor kids, and early, you give them early childhood education so that then they don't need special ed teachers and kinder, you know, and there's sort of a whole range of them. They are still, for the most part, really philanthropic plays. I mean, I think that the, the notion that these, that you're really gonna get a private investor, I mean, the New York State SIB, which was folk, not the city one, but the state one, which was had uh, Merrill Lynch do a private placement, and therefore Persian Square Foundation came in. But this was still the transaction cost, to your point, associated with putting together that deal far outweighed the benefits. Um, and I still think that they are, for the most part, and probably will in this iteration of them will be really philanthropic plays, and that's probably also true of dibs. I think that said, um, there's really interesting work that has come out of them that has to do with paper performance and evidence-based policy making, and this notion that you know we should only be putting taxpayer money um, into interventions that we know work, and so that the, the SIBs have sort of tested some of those and say, okay, well maybe the Rikers one didn't work, and so that intervention doesn't work, but you know, um, that there are others that have to do with like nurse family partner, you know, like early sort of m child and maternal health that actually do work. Um, I would say also what I think is interesting, and this may be more relevant than DIB in the developing impact bond context, it's just how quickly in some ways these are morphing. So we went from recidivism to early childhood education to maternal health. Um, I know in DC, like in the fall, I think the, I think it was Goldman Sachs and the Calvert Foundation and like the municipal sewers, you know, DC waterworks or whatever it is, put together $25 million, essentially a social impact bond, they call it an environmental impact bond to deal with water storm runoff and how that gets into the DC water systems. And I think that again, it's like to your question about what's innovation, like the idea was they said, okay, that SIP thing is kind of interesting. It's about paper performance and it's about bringing in private capital, but can we think about it in a totally different way? Can we think about it to the problem of like green infrastructure in Washington DC where we're only gonna pay for outcomes, we're only gonna pay for positive outcomes. So I think that they will start to take scale um, when people, when, when they start to be applied in context that we just haven't seen. The couple of dips I've seen have been so small, you know, like the sort of girls' education one in India where it's like, they're, it's not that they're not good, but you know, maybe they're basically straight up philanthropy plays. I totally agree, and the time horizons are completely different, and the complexity of all the drivers are very, I, I, I completely agree. I mean, those things work well when you can like isolate one, you know, in ways that are sort of artificial. There are very few problems that lend themselves to that kind of like isolation. Let's do one or two if we have them uh, here, and we'll do you, and maybe depending on how long this takes, we would have time for one more. Uh, and of course, uh, you can probably chit chat a little bit afterwards. I have to run, run to the five alarm news. fire uh, uh, and uh, introduce yourself, please. Uh, Jason Dunwit with No One. Just a question of clarity. When you said lay away, did you mean that they paid it before they took possession or did they pay it off after they took possession? No, so, so it's pay it well. So in the um, solar, in the in case of MCOPA and Angaza and solar, it, it varies. So they can, so it's, it's like they're pay, they're doing installment pay, payments and in some cases, and they're actually a variety of models. So in some cases it's sort of lease to own. Um, and in so, like, but they are, um, I actually think in, in most cases with the solar panels, they're actually installing them and then paying for them over time. But they, but you can do it in a, you can do it in a number of different ways. But the basic idea was that it's pay, it's install, I should have said installment payments rather than lay away. Uh, they're in the gray jacket. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Mark Schleifer. I'm with an organization called SIPE, the Center for International Private Enterprise. I haven't read the book, so I, that's terrible to admit, well, but I'm really looking forward to it. 
Um, uh, so thanks very much for your, you know, your, your presentation. Um, I think it was interesting that you said that there's a lot of companies that are not ready to accept investment from some of the, you know, the finance and the funds that are out there. I know that there are a lot of sort of interesting, innovative consulting firms that are working in the space in you know, a lot of emerging market countries, helping companies get investment ready. So you know, maybe that sort of that side needs to come up along with it. Um, my question, actually, our organization works mostly in the policy and the regulatory uh, environment, and, and my question has to do with the readiness of, in a lot of the countries that we're talking about, the, you know, the policy environment, the policy framework to you know, structure these kinds of investments and have these kinds of bonds and have these kinds of innovative finance companies operating. You know, what, you know, are, is the legal, you know, is the legal framework there and is anyone doing enough work on, on that side of things? And your, your question pertains to sort of emerging and developing, yeah. No, I mean, I think that that, you know, that in some ways has always been the question of development is do you have, you know, do you have the legal framework and do you have the um, sort of protection of intellectual property? Right? I mean, do you have all of the rights necessary to ensure that actually investments work and that there's transparency and you've counterparty these risks and all of mitigated and all of that? I think, I'm, I mean, I, I actually think, you know, ultimately, this is a, and, and some of the examples, so first of all, I think you're right, like your point about the capacity building and sort of getting enterprises investable is exactly right, and we are seeing more activity along those lines. I think ultimately, you know, these need to be, this is not gonna be a foreign direct, this is not gonna be a foreign assistance question, this is not gonna be a foreign philanthropy question, and it's not gonna be a foreign direct investment question. I mean, ultimately, these are gonna be investments that are gonna have to be made locally through local resources and local savings and local institutions. So sort of all the more reason to shore up the systems in place to safeguard those investments. I mean, I guess through the, and, and the number of the cases that I look at are sort of interesting innovations where you suddenly have funds that are, lo that are looking to allow for local, issue, local bond issuances in a way that it hadn't before or, ins or insurances against some of the, you know, sort of wraparound insurance in the way that we see here but that do nurture local market development because I think ultimately that's sort of the holy grail for everybody. It's you know, autonomy and ownership locally and it's sort of not reliant on foreign investment. Um, but there, you know, and it's obviously very country specific. But I, I agree, ultimately this is sort of, it's not gonna be a foreign investment or foreign philanthropy game as much as a, you know, organic investment in ownership. Let's take one more if uh, anybody has one and if not, that's okay, yep, go ahead. Introduce yourself, if you would, please, and wait for the mic, even though we can probably hear you. My name is Susie Syed, and I'm an independent consultant. Um, I work very closely with pension funds, be it in the U.S. or outside the U.S., and I'm interested to know a little bit more about what are your thoughts of the appetite of these institutional investors, be it governments outside the U.S., like sovereign wealth funds, or you know, big institutional investors, pension funds, or um, insurance companies, in the U.S. or outside, towards these uh, institution, the um, um, yeah, so I, the so products. It's a huge question and topic in itself. And actually, if to Mike wants to stick around, he can talk a little bit more. And he spent a lot of time with the sovereign wealth funds. I think that um, first of all, I think there's there is clearly appetite growing, and I think that that comes from a number of pressure, sort of external and internal forces, but I certainly think that, you know, there are some really dramatic examples of pension funds in the U.S., whether it's in California or even more local municipal ones where, you, you know, you have the people paying in who want, the, who want their pensions to be spent in ways that they align with their personal values, and sometimes that means a local investment in California, and sometimes that means, you know, if I, you know, I'm a teacher in New York City that I don't want my funds and my investment funds retired and in, invested in, in guns or invested in coal. And so I, I actually do think you see some very responsive pension funds. I think, um, you know, I do think that this question of fiduciary responsibility and how it's defined and more clarity around that is one that sort of on the policy front actually still needs a lot of work and clarification and sort of advancement. And I also think that just at some, at some point the data starts to speak for itself. And I think that when you have um, real leadership, whether it's from certain university endowments or other endowments or wealth funds, and they're making investments along that um, either are screening out bad stuff or proactively invested in good stuff. 
uh, and then the, re the returns speak for themselves um, and they're useful data points, that, that, that ultimately is going, to what is going to be what motivates, I think, the rest of them. And I think that the Trump administration would promote the interference more to take the risk out of pension funds investment and further leverage it with sovereign debt. There's many ways to, you can come down and 50 years ago, I was facing the same kind of day we're having right now. This administration came into power. It was like my life was changed. I gave this business to my wife. And today is exactly the same way. It feels like a change, a bad change. But I had to make a decision. What am I going to do? We just came out of President Obama. I'm going to think what we were facing our own lives. I was 22 years old. And, uh, and so I made a decision to work within the system. But I was really a critic all along. But right now, I'm not sure. Why don't you bring this in? It's your final approach for the runway, and we'll conclude with that. Uh, could be the basis for an entire panel. No, that's good. That's good. Keeps it lively. I, I do not think that this is an administration or a set of potential cabinet appointees that are bursting with ideas about how to do a whole lot of a whole lot of things, much less the type of stuff that we're speaking about. So I actually think, right, a glass is half full view would be that there is room to insert enlightened policy proposals. Let's, let's, let's go. <laughs> um, anyway. Okay, any, any uh, closing thoughts? No, I mean, I, again, th thank you. And um, Michael Finker, I know you have. Uh, My pleasure. Um, you have to go truth. sort out the truth from the not truths. Um, no, I just appreciate all of this and happy to stick around and come. I could thank you and would love to speak further. And people want to get the book. Do you have it oh. here or do they get we it online? It. We have it. We have Great. it outside, okay. right outside. Buy okay. the book. Thanks for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon.